Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Congregational Church, UCC Boulder. And we want you to know that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We're glad you have joined us in person and online today to celebrate God's beautiful earth, as yesterday was officially Earth Day. But for us, every day is Earth Day. I'd like to thank our climate action team for planning today's time of worship together and for planning Alternative Transportation Day to collectively continue to think about ways to lessen our carbon footprints. Thank you to all who are leading us in worship this morning, the Reverends Mark and Margot Pickett, Sarah, Chris, and Nora for providing Earth Day witnesses, to the Children's Choir and Youth Choir, our pickup choir, this is our pickup choir today, our musicians, and our AV techs. Thank you to everyone. Because we believe we are intimately bound to God, each other, the earth, and every living creation, we as a congregation also believe that creation is a gift from God. Therefore, it is our responsibility to care for the earth and all of her inhabitants. First Congregational Church has covenanted to be a creation justice church and commit ourselves as individuals and as a congregation to the intertwined responsibilities of caring for creation and seeking justice for the oppressed. You can read more about our covenant on page five of your bulletin. So before we, we begin worship today and praise God for creation and also to hear the reminders of our responsibility, the Climate Action Team has named today as Hike, Bike, Bus Plus Day to help us be creative in finding more green ways to come to worship. As I walked to church this morning, I was greatly relieved that the snow came yesterday and not today. But we celebrate everyone here today in whatever mode you came. We want to acknowledge, though, those who work to arrive in a more green way today. So if you would stand and remain standing as I name various modes of transportation. Um, so stand when I say your transportation, but stay standing. For those of you who walked, please stand and remain standing. For those of you who rode your bikes, stand up. If you came in an EV, an electric vehicle, stand. If you tubed down the Boulder Creek today, please stand. <laughs> Not one, okay. If you carpooled, please stand. If you rode the bus, please stand. If you were a pastor who lives in Longmont and had to leave at 6.45 and no one would join your carpool, please stand. <laughs> if there is some other mode of green transportation that I didn't name that you took, please stand. We almost had to have some skiing, but thanks goodness that was yesterday. Um, if you made it today in church, if you made it today to church, we celebrate all of God's children for coming to church, so please stand if you're in, in the sanctuary, stand in spirit or as you're able. Also, for those of you online, you can stand at home in body or spirit. We're glad you're all here today, so thank you for coming. Now, if you would turn to your neighbor and pass the peace of Christ to one another.
and, and we have our eco frog with us. In uh, September of last year, all U United Church of Christ churches were invited to have their children and youth create uh, drawings that represented climate hope. And so our elementary children decided to work on those. They were submitted at the end of November and then there was a contest and winners were chosen in different age groups. And we had five children who submitted artwork. All of our kids did them, but they were allowed to choose whether they wanted their artwork submitted or not, and not all chose to submit their artwork. So we are going to let you see what was submitted to the UCC. Um, so first, Gracie Reed. It's coming. Annika Ingersoll. Kate McClung. Garrison Steed and Singna Teitelbaum. And out of those five children, two were finalists. And I'd like to ask them to come up. Annika was a finalist in the six to nine-year-old category. And Kate, Kate was the winner in the six-year-old to nine-year-old category. And they also were sent certificates from the off National Office of the UCC. So, congratulations. <laughs> Listen to how everything sings. The streams and stones, leaves and branches, fish and fur covered ones, birds leading the chorus. See how your desire to praise is echoed in every living thing? How in quiet moments, the heart is moved to gratitude for all of creation, for the lavish abundance of it all. How nothing is earned, no achievements are needed. May you simply show up with breath, blood, and bones, and your loving attention to hymns erupting everywhere until you can no longer tell where yours begin and nature's ends.
this time we invite, oh, Deborah, did you want to say it? And we thank Kevin for representing one of the endangered species on our planet. And now please join me in a responsive reading from Psalm 104. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You make the springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills, giving drink to every animal. You cause the grass to grow for cattle and plants for people to use. Oil to make the face shine, and bread to strengthen the human heart. In them, the birds build their nests. The stork has its home in the fir trees. O oh God, how manifold are your works. The earth is full of your creatures. When you send forth your spirit, they are created. May the glory of God endure forever. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. I will rejoice in the Lord always. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I missed my cue at the 8.30 service, so I'm glad I got here on time this morning. Um, so what I want to talk about this morning is, I want to talk a little bit about the basics of climate change. Um, so I hope you don't start falling asleep already, but I want to start with that because I feel like climate change can be confusing. And I feel like our media doesn't do a great job of explaining to us what's really happening with the Earth. I feel like we understand some things pretty well, but I feel like there's some essential things that we really don't understand at all. And if we don't understand what's happening to our Earth, then it's hard to know what we need to do about it. So I'd like to start by um, asking you some questions, and I might even ask for some audience participation. We'll see how it goes. So I think you all know that we started burning fossil fuels oil, coal, and natural gas during the Industrial Revolution, you know, 150 years ago. And that's when we started releasing carbon dioxide into the air. And that CO2 started trapping heat, and our climate started getting warmer, and it started causing problems for us. Does anyone know how much the Earth has warmed since pre-industrial times? How much warming we've already experienced? 
since, say, 1850? It's a hard thing to guess if you're not a scientist. <laughs> and I know some of you are scientists and you know the answer. Uh, our Earth has warmed 1.1 degrees Celsius since pre-industrial times. And we've already felt a lot of impacts from that warming um, that I'm sure all of you can think of in your minds. Um, and again, this might be a little rough, but if someone wants to say something out loud that they have experienced themselves or that they've read about or that they're worried about that we've already experienced at that 1.1 degree warming, does anyone want to say anything? I'll repeat it through the mic so everyone can hear it. Wildfires. I'm sorry? Flooding. The polar bears. Habitat reduction. Drought. Loss of glaciers. Loss of creature, creatures, species extinction. Um, yeah, those are all, you, you did very well. You got pretty much my whole list. Um, extinction of species, um, spreading of disease. We actually have reduced food security and reduced water security. We have more deaths from extreme heat and humidity. Uh, we have more people having to leave their homes and be displaced because of extreme weather. Um, so we're experiencing all of that because we're at 1.1 degree warming. Um, and of course, as far as we know, we just continue to get warmer and warmer. Um, last year, we set a worldwide record for, CO, for car carbon dioxide emissions um, since records were kept. Oh, that's a great question. I am so happy and relieved that I know the answer to that question. <laughs> it's 1.1 Celsius is about two degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I thought about adding that to it, this talk, but I didn't want to confuse you too much. Um, and the reason I'll stay with Celsius is because everything you'll read in the literature and here on the media will be in Celsius because that's the language of, of scientists and international work on this issue. But that's a great question. Um, Allison, where am I now? Okay, um, okay so, so if you keep warming, um, obviously with every degree of, intense, of more warming, we get worse and worse effects, right? But just last month, the UN released a climate report that told us something that they've been telling us for a while, which is that there is a point at which they say, if we warm past that, it's going to be very difficult to adapt to the changes that will start to happen in our environment. And that level is 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. It's not that much above where we are today. If we get above that, they're saying we'll force we'll start to face climate-fueled events that we just cannot adapt to. So what are we doing about it? Um, you may have heard of the Paris Accords, which many countries on Earth have come together to agree to, and which we rejoined a few years ago. Um, and they are making important progress toward getting countries to commit to lowering their carbon dioxide. The problem with the Paris Accord is that scientists are telling us if every country in the Paris Accord keeps their commitment, which is a big if, if they keep their commitment, the temperature rise on the Earth by the year 2100 will be 2.8 degrees Celsius. So it's not, what we have in place is not going to get us to where we need to be to have a safe and livable planet. So if that's the case, what do we need to do? Um, again, scientists are telling us and told us last month that what we have to do, not surprisingly, is we have to stop burning oil and coal and natural gas. Um, what may surprise you is that we have to completely stop burning those three things by 2040. Um, if we don't stop burning those things by 2040, we're going to exceed the 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. Um, and that's gonna be a challenge for the United States in particular because today, we get 80% of our energy from those three sources. So going from 80% today to zero by 2040, it's a colossal challenge to our society. Um, so I can kind of feel the weight in the room right now. It's a hard thing to hear this. It's very hard. I'm getting a little choked up myself. So I want you to know that you are not the only people who know this information. There are millions of people around the world who know this information and who are fighting, sorry, I'm a little choked up, a little choked up, who are fighting to solve this problem. So here's what I do not want you to do. I don't want you to think about your own personal carbon footprint. 
So for those of you who had to sit during all those things, hike, bike, you know, and you're feeling guilty that you didn't get to stand up, do, this is not, no. That's not what I want you to do. That is not helpful. Do not feel guilty about that. The idea of the person carbon, personal carbon footprint was developed by the fossil fuel industry. Because they're not doing anything wrong. You're doing something wrong. You need to stop driving your car. You need to stop taking airline flights. You need to start eating a plant-based diet. That's the answer. Don't look at us. We're not doing anything. We're not doing anything wrong. So the question I think we should all ask ourselves is not what can I do? What must be done? What must be done? And we're up against some really big, um, sorry, I think I'm just missing a note card here. Um, so the good news is we have all the technology we need to get to zero fossil fuels by 2040. We don't need to wait for some new technological innovation. Um, does anyone want to throw out some of the things that they think we need to be doing in order to get to zero fossil fuels by 2040? This one's a little harder, but we'll give it a shot. Anyone? Solar, Solar yes. Solar. Wind. Wind. I saw... Yes, water power? Did I hear that right? Okay, yes, water power. Electric cars. Thank you so much. I don't have time to do the whole thing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I wish we could do that longer. But basically, wind and solar in particular are, are by far our most powerful things that we need to invest in. They're extremely efficient at getting us off the fossil fuels. There's a whole list I don't have time to go into now, and maybe it would be a little too boring for this morning, but there is another set of things that we can do that I feel we don't hear enough about from the media that I think are really essential. And I think the way to think about this is if we continue to have cheap, available oil, natural gas, and coal, do you think we'll just turn away from it? Or do you think, as long as it's there, we will burn it, right? So we can invest in green energy, and that's excellent. I think you all may know in the Inflation Reduction Act, we allocated $400 billion toward incentivizing green energy, and that's wonderful. A huge step in the right direction, and I'm super encouraged by that. But what's happening on the other side of the equation with fossil fuels? Um, we need to start doing things that stop the flow of fossil fuels, oil, natural gas, and coal. So for example, we need to stop permitting those projects. Our governments permit those projects. Coal companies come to us, natural gas companies come to us, oil companies come to us, and we have to tell them that they can drill. And we're telling them that, we can, that they can and we're giving them piece, the piece of paper, yep, go do your project. We're still doing that today. We're doing it in Colorado. We have to stop subsidizing fossil fuels. Why would we subsidize a product that we don't want to be using? And the third thing, which other countries are doing, is taxing the production of coal, oil, and gas. So it's more expensive, and we're more incentivized to move toward the green sources of energy. Um, okay, so what do we do with all this information? How do we start affecting, especially as a congregation that cares about this issue, how can we affect what's happening politically? I think what I've hopefully I've laid out for you is that this is a political fight. We have to change this at the societal level. So in the next few months, the Climate Action Team is going to be advertising ways out to the congregation that you can get more involved at a political level in this fight or the switch away from fossil fuels to green energy. But there's one thing that I would really like you to do, and I would ask you to do, even if you can't do the more involved things, and that is I would like you to pray for climate every single day. So what I do some, at night, and sometimes when I only have the energy to do one prayer, I kneel down beside my bed, I put my hands together, and I say, God, please help us to stop burning oil, natural gas, and coal by 2040. Amen. And that's my only prayer. So um, I'm hoping that you will pray that prayer with me, and I will lead us so you can repeat after me. Dear God, please help us to stop burning, stop burning. 
oil, natural gas, and coal, oil, gas, and coal. By, 2040. by 2040. Amen. Thank you. Good morning. My name's Chris, and I'm a proud member of First Kong here, along with my wife, Jill. I work in atmospheric research at NCAR here in Boulder, and the science, as Sarah presented, is clearer on some of the dire ways in which we are harming creation. So when learning about the enormity of environmental crises throughout my career, I've often experienced despair and I'd be being dishonest if I didn't lose some hope for the future at times. However, when we lose hope, we often become disengaged. And I realize now it is when we become disengaged, perhaps as a mechanism to avoid pain, we lose sight of our calling to follow God's living word. One of these precepts is honoring and repairing creation. So what do I mean here by the living word of God? So in the book of John, it is stated, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines through the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So in Franciscan theology, this Bible verse is interpreted such that every creature and element of creation itself, they are all little words of God. And it is only by being engaged in this word of God and being attentive to the profundities of God's creation that we can gain the love and strength that is required to nurture our home. So as much as some of today's crises can paralyze us with grief and despair, our keen multidimensional senses are an essential gift. Importantly, they bring us awareness of the problems before us, which is always the first step in healing and improving our situation. But more powerfully, our senses can be used to bring us hope and faith in the darkness, and therefore the strength that God requires of us. And it is with what remains of our current home that we are called to love and nurture with all our strength. To that end, I would like to uh, share some encouraging views from Franciscan members of the Christian faith. In the book, Care for Creation, A Franciscan Spirituality of the Earth, the authors reflect, do we love this home, our earth, or do we simply use it? We may exist in a place but if we do not love in that place, then we truly do not live there. It is easy to disregard or destroy that which is unloved. Care for Creation also states, nothing in creation is accidental or excessive. Nothing is worthless or trivial. Each and everything, no matter how small or seemingly insignificant, is of infinite value because it reflects God in its own unique being. Because God's being is the foundation of the natural order, the ineffable is made tangible through the concrete existence of all reality. And they conclude in this paragraph, to really know Christ, therefore, we must live attentively to the particularities of creation. Without such attention, we can easily lose living contact with Christ in his most widely extended body, 
the universe. So I want to close by encouraging us all, myself included, to do two homework assignments. First, I recommend all of us who are able to take some time to meditate in the extravagant elements of the wild here around Boulder. This is, in fact, the nourishing activity that helps me keep focused on what we need to protect, the gifts of our home that are still here, and it keeps me from being in despair. For example, some of my favorite things to do around here is to listen to the plangent calls of the towns on solitaires in the wintertime in the pines, or to delight in the R2-D2-like sounds of the western meadowlark uh, that we see coming out this time of year. Uh, we, it's also very empowering and relaxing to listen to the white noise of South Boulder Creek rushing down El Dorado Canyon, and to become captivated by the many flowers that are going to start emerging now, and their pollinators that emerge in the early summer up the sides of the trail. So it is here that I believe we can find a very special message from God, that beauty and the serenity we gain in such meditation is God's transcendent love for his creation and our role in it. In this inspiration, we are called to care deeply for God's creation. And secondly, the much tougher assignment, but needed, uh, was covered very well by Sarah, so I won't repeat, but I wanted to mention that there's a lot of ways we can act individually, and also, as Sarah says, we need to act on a much larger uh, arena, and that includes getting involved at the political level, putting pressure on our legislatures, and so forth. And of course, I, I invite you to talk to our climate action team, or even join us if you would like. So our home is God's creation, and I've determined that we are all called to protect it with our full spirit. While confronting the environmental crisis of today is an incredible challenge, we can feel confident God will be by our side as we work in love to remedy the ills of our world. I would like to, be to begin by thanking Sarah and Chris for sharing their knowledge and experiences. In my speech, when I refer to those in our com church community who are doing what needs to be done, I'm referring to people like them. People born within the last two decades spent their childhoods believing a fairy tale that they would be able to get married, live where they want, have children, and pursue happiness to the same extent as their parents and grandparents. At some point, they will all realize this may not be entirely true. The selfish illusions of eternal economic growth that the world exists in will be the death of this fairy tale. The impact that climate disaster will have on the adult lives of youth today will define the difference between their lives and the lives of past generations. Civilization must overcome the pattern of destruction that infests Earth's global society, evolving into a life-affirming and sustainable civilization while repairing the devastation upon Earth's ecosystems and people. I see in our church's covenants a commitment to fulfill these needs our strong belief in love, equity, and justice is exactly what this broken world needs. And our faith in God will give us the strength to face these battles presented by climate, the climate crisis. Jeremiah offers the timely lament, I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruits 
and rich produce, but you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. The consequences of living in a climate-changed world will be felt by every generation to come. Political inaction to prevent cl the climate crisis impedes what some would consider fundamental human rights. The right to choose where you live, the right to choose to have children, and the right to a healthy life are all threatened by climate change. The increase in frequency of dangerous weather events has created a rise in the number of climate refugees, which is only projected to increase. In her TED Woman speech, Colette Battle explains that by the end of the century, it's predicted that 180 million people will be displaced due to climate change. We have a responsibility to respond to the needs of these individuals, but we also must demand that change be made to prevent as much of this forced migration as possible. By 2050, 24 million children are projected to be malnourished because of climate change alone, which is over half the number of children currently suffering from severe malnutrition globally each year. Reversing a positive trend in global hunger over the last few decades. Fears about the likelihood that temperatures will rise by 1.5 degrees Celsius in the next two decades, as projected by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, have climate-conscious individuals choosing between modern luxuries and individual rights, and cutting personal carbon emissions. Personally, I know that every life decision I anticipate making when transitioning into adult life will be affected by climate change. While going to college in California is an appealing prospect to me, the rising water levels and worsening natural disasters will likely make it a very difficult place to live very soon, and that's very frightening to me. In past generations, my love for children would have made motherhood a near guarantee. Now, I seriously doubt that I could handle the guilt and anxiety that would come with bringing a child into a collapsing world. I have been forced to put my personal desires aside because I no longer think having children would be a respons responsible decision. I don't aim to persuade anyone else to this belief, but I'm not the only one who feels this way. According to analysts at Morgan Stanley, the movement to not have children owing to fears of climate change is growing and impacting fertility rates quicker than any preceding, child in the, any pre preceding trend in the field of fertility decline. This claim is supported by a study of 18,000 couples in China that showed a 20% increased likelihood of infertility motivated by climate change. While some people are worried about the impact kids have on the planet, others are worried about the impact climate change will have on their kids. The reality of living in a climate-changed world with unprecedented challenges is understandably a source of great anxiety for many people across the world, primarily youth. In a study done last year by researchers from a plethora of universities across Northern Europe and the US that examined 10,000 people from 10 countries, all between ages 16 and 25, more than 45% of the respondents said that they feel about, the way they feel about climate change adversely affects their day-to-day -day lives. And those living in poorer countries in the Southern Hemisphere who are more likely to be affected by natural disasters worsened by climate change, the outlook is even worse. Young people are the most affected by climate change and many youths have taken it upon themselves to advocate against inaction. But we cannot make change alone. It brings me hope to see others across the generations of our church moving from individual gestures of change, such as recycling and driving less, to developing the political will for our society to make the changes we must to ensure a future where my generation will be able to survive. Whether climate change will ultimately be a cataclysmic or existential threat to humanity depends on the changes our society is willing to make. I take comfort and pride in the church community around me who is willing to stand up and fight for my future. And together, we can hold on to the hope God offered Solomon in 2 Corinthians. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will heal their land.
Will you join me in prayer? Holy God, long ago when your prophets saw a nation rife with greed and corruption, they cried out, Hoy! A deep, soul-filled lament that means woe. Yet in the prophets' mouths, it was not merely a lament. It was also a word of judgment. Woe, they cried. Woe to you. Today on this Creation Justice Sunday, it is as if our planet itself has joined that chorus of lament and judgment. Floods inundate, inundate Fort Lauderdale. Tornadoes tear across the country south and Midwest. A multi-year drought robs the Colorado of its waters. And even along the Front Range, air is increasingly not only something that we breathe, but something that we see as ozone and other pollutants transform air that was once pristine into something that is... A recent study by the American Lung Association said air along the Denver area, the Front Range, is some of the worst polluted in the nation. Woe to you, the planet shouts. Woe. But it's not just the earth that cries. It's also the people whose homes are lost, or fields flooded, or neighborhoods that have become untenable because of the latest toxic waste spill. It seems that with each passing day, the cry of lament grows louder and louder. And yet, our children draw pictures that our denomination puts on postcards that will go out to inspire and help shift perceptions of what truly is important in this world and what is not. Today, many have walked, biked, bussed, or carpooled here in order to help reduce our collective carbon footprint, even as others among us lobby for new laws that will protect and renew this fragile planet we call home. Just gathering here today on this Creation Justice Sunday reminds us that we are not alone in this work. We stand shoulder to shoulder with so many others. And let us never forget that this beautiful, delicate, wondrous world is not ours, O oh God. It is yours merely on loan to us. And the work we do to protect and preserve it is not ours alone either. It is also yours. So standing among us, O oh God, grant us courage to fight the good fight. Gift us with patience that we might not become discouraged. And still in our hearts, a vision of what might be rather than merely what is. And ignite a spark deep in our souls that will never let that vision dim. Gracious God, as we raise our voices today for our planet, we also pray for those among us. We pray for Gail Henry, Henry, Stephanie Angel, Harriet Simons, recovering from surgery. And we also remember Ed Byrne, who had extensive surgery yesterday for a badly broken leg 
and we keep Ed and Ann in our prayers. We pray for Eleanor Graziel, mother of Pat Whitaker, recovering from a fall, Becky Houghton and Steve Winograd, husband of Charmaine Getz, who continue in treatment. For Donna Clough and family, as Tom is in hospice, and for John and Malin Edlin in the death of John's brother Frank. And we also pray for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones everywhere. We pray for the unhoused and for all who suffer from addiction and for the family members of those who have suffered overdoses and for those who have died. And we especially remember first responders who provided treatment and for their trauma as well and for the trauma that is experienced by those who witness such horrific acts in our community. Finally, O oh God, God of truth and grace, hear us as we add our voices to the voice of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. On behalf of all of us, we're so grateful to our climate action team, to Mark and Margo, to Sarah, to Chris, to Nora, and to the whole team. If you look in your bulletin, you'll see there that there is an invitation to join them on the same page where our Creation Justice Covenant is written. They meet on the fourth Tuesday of every month at 7 o'clock, and you are always welcome to join them. There is, a, I will put a sign-up sheet in the, in the narthex, or actually in the link, so that you can sign up to find out more if you're interested. I'm also grateful for all the ways that you keep the concern for our climate before us, including it in every way, in small ways, personal ways, and on a much larger scale, and even in this building. I'll tell you that tomorrow night on the agenda for the Board of Management, is, uh, is a plan to t our, our, our gas-fired um, beast in the kitchen downstairs is about to be replaced with, with, an, electric, with an electric oven, um, which can be connected to more renewable sources of energy. So even, even that in, in our building here, um, we, we take steps. So we have geothermal pumps powered um, that, that, that uh, warm and cool our building, the Faith Center. We have LED lights everywhere in the building, and now we're working on the stove and the oven. So thank you to all of you for being here today. It, your presence with us makes our worship stronger, richer, better in every way. So in that spirit, if you are seated along the center aisle, please reach down in front of you or beside you and find the blue folder. Open it up, fill it out, and pass it back and forth down the row and back, taking note of the names of the people with whom you are seated. If you find that you're seated next to someone who you haven't met before, please take a moment after the service to introduce yourself more personally. If you are joining us through the live stream, just, before, just below your video screen, you will find a link that leads to an online form, and you, which you can use in a variety of ways. 
to let us know that you joined us for worship, to introduce yourself more fully if you'd like, and to send us a prayer request if you'd like. If you are seated here in the sanctuary, you'll find a pad of paper in front of you that you may use to write a prayer request. Whatever is on your heart this day, for yourself, for others, for the world, you may place that in the offering plate when it comes around. Linda and I, we read these during the week and we join our prayers to yours. Following worship today, we hope that you will remain for a time of refreshments and conversation. Today is Soup Kitchen Sunday, which means that we're feeding our hungry neighbors downstairs, and so our coffee hour is on this level of the building. It's actually going to be in the link today, so if you just exit the sanctuary, you'll be able to smell the coffee. Also today, following worship, we are pleased to welcome Rabbi Ava Boulder and Avraham Kornfeld to lead us in learning about the Jewish practice of Shabbat, Sabbath. We'll be meeting down the hall in the Standish Room from noon or as soon as it seems that everyone has gathered um, until 1.30 today and lunch will be served. Today is the first of two sessions during the month of April. April, and then it's all leading up to Friday evening, May 12th, when we have been invited to join Congregation Bonai Shalom for worship at 5.30, their Sabbath worship on Friday, May 12th, and then a Shabbat dinner following at 6.15. Your experience of the May worship, or the Mar yeah, the May worship service and Shabbat dinner will be greatly enriched by your participation in the Sunday forums but they are not a prerequisite. In other words, come whenever you can to the forums, to the dinner. Because we are purchasing food for all of these events, it does help us to prepare for you if you register. So please note the announcement in your bulletin about how to register electronically. There's also a clipboard in the link if you would prefer to sign up the old-fashioned way. Please take a moment also, if you haven't already, to review the other announcements in your bulletin for upcoming events, opportunities for worship and learning, service, music, fellowship, all of the things that build our community and make us who we are. If you would like to make a financial contribution to sustain and strengthen our ministry, you can find information about the ways to give on the front inside page of your bulletin. As we turn now, to our time of offering, let us give thanks to God, who has shown us the meaning of generosity in the beauty and bounty of creation, in the overflowing love of Christ, in the leading of, of God's spirit, and in the life we are blessed to share with one another. The morning offering will now be given and received.
pray. Let us pray. God, our creator, as we marvel at the splendor of the stars, the sun, the earth, we lift our hearts in praise and we pray that you would bless us again. Bless every gift and every giver. Bless us in our commitment to you and to the earth. As your purpose shines before us, we dedicate all that we have and all that we are to your good work in the world. Welcoming the stranger, feeding the hungry, serving human wholeness and the well-being of all creation, caring for your world. Humbly we bow before you, with praise we adore you. In your image may we grow and live and love. All this we pray through Christ, whose call to follow fills our every prayer. Amen. And now, if you will, let us join our voices together in an act of commitment. God of life and giver of hope, 
We pledge ourselves to care for creation, to reduce our waste, to live sustainably, and value the rich diversity of life. May your wisdom guide us that life in all its forms may flourish and may be faithful in voicing creation's praise. And now go forth to celebrate the splendor and wonder of God's good earth, even as you work to defend it. And as you go, may the road rise up to meet you. May the wind always be at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may you be held in the palm of God's hand. Amen.